Welcome to this session of the Foresight Existential Hope Group. Uh, if you joined us before, you know that the idea for this group is that we live at a very high stake time in the history of the great human project. What's um, really going on is that uh, we live at a very high stake time um, and because we only have one planet uh, at least so far uh, but yet there are serious threats to the very existence of our home uh, no, uh, in particular via runaway ecosystem destabilization uh, our historical practices uh, and unleashed industrial activities needed to support our billions in the current economic system have uh, led to pushing the, the boundaries of uh, our natural processes and the carrying capacity of the planet. So what's a human race to do? It's a complex multifaceted problem and to meet our challenges, we will need to tackle them through a multi-angle approach. And we will discuss several of those today um, and beyond we'll ask ourselves the question uh, what flourishing futures can we actively build towards can humanity find balance within its ecosystem and be a net positive for the planet there is no guarantee we'll make it but if we don't try we cannot succeed so why did i invite will today um, will is the co-founder of Planet Labs. Planet uses the world's largest fleet of satellites to image the entire Earth every day and uh, thus making change visible, accessible, and actionable. But more broadly, uh, will reflect on policy, on biodiversity, and the civilizational changes needed for us to overcome ecosystem challenges and create flourishing, abundant futures. But that's not all. Will is a friend and a close collaborator who I wanted to invite here because I think he embodies uh, the very philosophy of the Existential Hope Group. Yes, uh, Will, I think you're uh, definitely an optimist as shown, for instance, by your uh, article, which I will share about turning the pandemic into an opportunity to protect uh, the wildlife. Uh, but you're not a blind techno optimist. Uh, I would call you like a, a lucid realist, uh, a lucid idealist. Uh, I think you're both very aware and conscious of the direness of the situation we are in. Um, and uh, you know the thin line between envisaging super exciting uh, futures and how much work it is to get there and how hard the work has to be. So yeah, you walk this, this line yourself uh, between being optimistic and actively advancing technology and being really careful and conscious about how you do it. Um, finally, I would say you're also a pragmatist idealist. Uh, you, um, you embrace the long-term view uh, a bold and daring one, but with a philosophy to make things actionable and a strategy for concrete action like with Planet Labs. Um, and so before we get into strategies and actionable stuff, uh, I wanted us to zoom out, out, out and look at the long-term picture, um, which is what is for you the most ambitious um, vision you can envisage for humanity, like what, uh, what is the, the long-term uh, goal for you and uh, what is the, the, the most exciting vision? Uh, yeah, just like give us, give us your piece of existential hope. What is possible? Well, uh, firstly, hi everyone and, and uh, happy Earth Day. Uh, happy it's really Earth fun Day. to be here and see lots of familiar faces and to meet those I don't know um, look forward to this discussion and just keeping it informal I just came straight in dirty hands so I'm like volunteering for Earth Day this is my one exception because it's Earth Day related <laughs> uh, meeting um, no but it's uh, you know like uh, 
it's, it's an, a good day to reflect on on the beautiful ecosystems we have on this planet and how unique it is. We've been looking at lots of other planets around uh, uh, other star systems. Now we've, we know many thousand of them and pretty much every star has a few planets uh, thereabouts on average, a couple. And uh, by far the best one, for sure, hands down, <laughs> still remains this one. <laughs> like not even close. <laughs> and we found some cool stuff, but um, you know, just to put it in perspective, our planet really, really, really is um, um, the most hospitable for us, of course. We evolved here. Um, so we are particular to this one, but even notwithstanding that, um, our planet is is a, is a really a, a Goldilocks planet, and uh, in all senses. And uh, so, you know, stepping back, when you think about it, uh, um, about where we are as a position of life in the universe, uh, what we haven't yet discovered other life. I think it's quite likely we will in the next decade. Um, it's another talk discussion, but um, mainly through detecting um, the sort of life effects on atmospheres of nearby planets that will soon be able to tell the atmospheric contributions of. And I think that's just super exciting. So these next generation ground based telescopes might be able to do that. But until then, we are the only life that we have found thus far in the universe. And the universe is really big. Um, you know, it turns out really, really, really big. Um, I, 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 uh, I once calculated it was of, of order, what is it? Uh, of order uh, 10,000 million Earths for every human on the Earth, if you just did a quick calculation of how many of these kind of planets there are. I mean, it's just goddamn huge, right? 100 billion stars and 100 billion in each galaxy, and there's about 100 billion galaxies. And roughly speaking, almost all of it is gas and dust and rocks, and almost none of it is lifey stuff. And so, you know, it's not just like a little fraction. It's like It's not just like... 99% rocks or 99.999% rocks and dust and gas. It's like 99.999999999. You know, you're going to go on for like a few days and then say something else, right? As by our current understanding. So life is extraordinarily uh, and uh, uh, small by mass in this universe. So if I look at it that that way, I would say that um, of course the first prerogative is is understanding the universe because we, you know, if, if we uh, 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 that's that's the biggest thing we can do, the highest ideal, I think. You know, that's, I think, the, the best purpose one can think of. In order to do that, though, we better keep this life around and protect it and preserve it, because uh, otherwise we don't get any future wishes. Um, so actually our first priority becomes, I think, the sanctity of our life and uh, not, not, not just in esoteric understanding of the universe. It's mainly about protecting ourselves so that we can then go and understand the universe. But I would say, given the fact that there's so little life in the universe, thus far at least, and the cosmological um, the responsibility we have to maintain it, um, so security becomes number one. But if and when we get beyond that, I do believe that um, spreading life into the rest of the universe is a good thing, um, so-called greening the universe. I don't think we were there yet, but in the long arc, I think we should more. I'm not sure how much more, but I definitely think it's much more than, you know, 0.000000000 whatever, lots of zeros, one percent of the universe. It should be a bit more than that, both for its own safety, but also for its diversity and, and explosion and just the sheer beauty of the limited amount of life that's in this beautiful complex form, a limited amount of matter that's in this beautiful complex form we call life. Um, so that's what I, those were the, would be how I would start on the big goals, Lou. I don't know if that's anything like what you were hoping me to say. I, I... Totally, and that's uh, that's really something I, I align with. Um, at least, uh, I mean, especially on the point about like knowing the universe. Like, I feel really, really so curious. Like, if there was really one thing I, I could have is like the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Um, and uh, I agree with you that the only way to get there is to survive long enough, you know, or, or at least till we can more. Um, and so I, I really I profoundly relate to this. Um, and I appreciate that you're, you're setting like super ambitious vision. That's totally it. Um, and something we say often here is um, there's, there's so much dystopia uh, out there. Uh, we, there are very little, um, sort of positive framings, you know, to know what to aim for. And uh, yeah, yeah I, I appreciated uh, this, this, um, 
vision you set. And so now that we know something we can that's really extraordinary that we can aim for, I guess we can get into like pragmatic stuff and be like, okay, how, how do we actually um, do it? And um, I kind of want to not start with uh, Planet Labs. I want to start uh, with a topic that you and I uh, have talked about many times and is um, perhaps, uh, yeah, I, I just think it's, it's a very original point of view that, that you have, that you have written about and that you talk about sometime, which is um, the framing for the, the actual planet emergency. And you wrote this article uh, that uh, says, um, that touches on that and saying like climate misses the point. We should talk about biodiversity loss uh, actually. And I wanted to know if you would, uh, yeah, get us started with your point of view on this. Um, sure. And yeah, please. Uh, sure, well, you know, so we're gonna, and try and understand the universe and try and keep life around and and yeah let's get down to the brass tacks of what that's going to take um i mean look you know i, I think let's let's it starts with what's intrinsically valuable and and that's life and not not gas in the atmosphere whether or not there's x parts per million of co2 or y parts per million co2 what what we care about fundamentally is the life on the earth and it turns out that climate change isn't really the big driver of a biodiversity loss, the eco side that we are thoroughly under now. I have a hopeful view about how we can get through it, but let me just start with the depressing side of it. Um, we have lost 68% of life on the earth in the last 40 years. Not future prediction, already gone. It is a massive eco side. It's not lost most by, by, by species type and number it's by actual just that's just about the if you like the number of animals the number of birds the number of fish but so for example we've lost 82 percent of land mammals um uh the non-domesticated ones um the we have uh, lost 70 percent of fish in the, in the rivers and the uh, lakes we've lost 75 percent of insects we've lost most birds we've lost most coral reefs we've lost you know, just we have decimated life on the earth already, not hypothetical future. And how do we do that? There's actually very little to do with climate change. Now is what we have done. It's pretty simple. We have wiped out the forest and we have overfished. And we've done all this trawling on the ocean floor and we've polluted the rivers and these, these, these things. It's actually climate change is like the fourth or fifth factor. Now, it's a big one that's coming up. I'm not saying let's not get on it. And I think we really should need to get on climate change. I just think it's missing the point in that the biggest thing, our deforestation and overfishing, you know, this, you know, these are the things we've got to stop now, not like hypothetical future. So, um, and, and um, so that's my perspective on that. And that's the problem statement is how do we curb that? Um, and just and, and so in terms of sheer numbers, we've already wiped out most life. Um, but in 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 biodiversity terms, uh, uh, you know, we've we've only wiped out a few of the species, luckily so far. But we are wiping them out at about a hundred to a thousand times the background rate of species extinction. Al always there's turnover in species, but we've suddenly ramped it up hundred to a thousand fold. That's not cool. I don't think it's our right to do that. I think we need to stop doing that. But it's, the worst thing is it's on the verge of collapse because after you, you fragment a forest so far and then suddenly I think you're going to lose a lot of it. And thankfully, so far, we haven't got to that point. We haven't got to that knee in the curve. But I think we're very close with, in, in, in the oceans and on the forest. Uh, so, so we're really close to that point where we... Um, and, and so we can't carry on decimating, you know, 15% of the biomass on the planet, the wild biomass, per decade which is roughly the rate that we're currently doing it. We need to stop that, and it starts by protecting land. I'm, I'm a huge advocate for the Half Earth or, or the 30 by 30 project, any of these ones that is basically advocating for protecting large areas of land, um, large areas of ocean, especially in key biodiverse regions from human um, human encroachment. And so I think that's what, you know, that's the simplest thing to do, right? And so then you can break down into how do we go about that? Um, well, there's things that nations can do. 
and there's things that individuals can do. And, you know, the big leaders of the world need to do this and the, and the individuals can need to do this. And I think um, the, the hopeful piece that I have, the, the message of hope that I have around this, this otherwise tragedy is that actually the number of changes we, we need to make is not that great. And what we just saw uh, and through COVID, um, um, the, you know, a small silver lining in a way, is that we managed to change behavior in dramatic ways in a short interval. We went from, you know, shaking hands to not shaking hands, from going to the office to not going to the office, from traveling all around the world to not traveling all the world, around the world in the short space of a month or two. Well, if we can do that, we can do some of these other things too. I mean, it's not that hard. We don't have to stop travel as much as we already did for COVID, <laughs> for example, in terms of, you know, reducing our um, impact on, 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 on uh, 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 you know, atmospheric contributions from, from planes. Um, uh, we do need to change our diet. I mean, in a significant way, that's the biggest driver. Um, so individuals need to change their diet. I mean, reducing meat and fish consumption is a big, big thing. I think we've got to, to get in as individuals to the to the broad problem of, of overpopulation. In the end, it's about the carrying capacity of the planet. Lou, you already mentioned this. So I think we have to, you know, people have to be wary about um, having lots of ki kids. I think that's a worry, and that, that gets to women education in developing countries that's the dominant you know way you can change that trajectory uh, so i think we need to do that um and um and then i think there's just getting out there and protecting parks you know individuals can go and do that so uh, you know when i think about what individuals need to do it's it's basically plant-based diets for the most part or at least radically reduce meat consumption and fish consumption um it's um it's uh, it's it's Supporting um, green politicians, it's it's um, it's protecting and volunteering in local parks, and then if it's if you're wealthy, it's stop flying so much. If you're poor, educate your girls. <laughs> you know, it's something like that for individuals, and then for the nations and the leaders, it's quite simple as well. I think it's 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 establishing these parks um, and uh, protected marine protected areas. Uh, we've got to do that relatively quickly, um, and then. Um, um, it's sustainable farming, uh, sustainable and regenerative farming uh, and fisheries is a huge way. Uh, agriculture is 25% of the land area of the earth. We've just got to make it more efficient and sustainable in the sense of not killing the soil. And that starts with regenerating that soil underneath. That's both good for biodiversity, good for our healthy uh, food. It's good for um, carbon capture. It's good for longevity of those farms. There's, all, there's loads of reasons why we should in, ensure sustainable farming. Um, and it's switching to renewable energy, so getting to the climate change point. And again, like, you know, I, I don't, I don't I, you know, I'm really disappointed with all these, these climate change commitments. And people are, like, always pushing the goals to beyond their administration. Like, okay, great, so we're 30-30. Well, that's conveniently just outside of Biden's administration having to, to – you do anything, you know, in a way. And the same with the EU, same with the uh, UK. And it's like so frustrating that they keep on pushing them out beyond the time window that they're actually responsible for. Why not today? We know how to put lots of solar farms on the ground. We know how to stop um, de deforesting the planet. We know how to do these things. Uh, so I think we need to do it today in four months, not four years or eight years or 10 years or 20 years. Like, so I'm I'm all for just doing it quickly. Sorry, ran ran, ran over, but uh, you know that's that's how I think about what individuals and nation states have to do to stop the biodiversity loss. Uh, is there something in the current context that uh, gives you hope? Because you know, I mean, the, I think the, the biodiversity uh, problem is pretty. I mean, when I think about it, like super hard to 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 just envisage you know it's sort of really painful and uh like sometimes i feel a little bit of grief about it um yeah yeah do you think there is reason for hope or should we it's true yeah no no uh, i think there's reason for hope i look i, I think that the future is like we've got this sort of you know fork in the road because and and it's not clear what which one we're going to go on yet but there's this balance between amazing new tools to bring to bear on those problems like satellite data and, uh, you know, regenerative farming practices and God knows how many other things, um, CO2 capture technologies or what have you. Um, and then there's 
there's just a rapid w way in which we are not, uh, I mean, the ways in which we are not changing behavior and therefore uh, um, uh, really hurting ecosystems today. So, you know, the current vector is really bad, um, but we've got tools that could enable us to jump to a much more hopeful trajectory. Um, you know, again, like, actually, if you think about curbing um, loss of, of forests, um, it's not actually that hard. The vast majority is to clear land for cows, stop eating fucking beef. I mean, it's so fucking simple. We can all just do that today, you know, literally today. Like, if anyone eats that stuff, stop it, you know. Fish, same. Like, I mean, really be careful on all those things. Like, roughly speaking, that it's five times more efficient to grow the same calorie in land for agriculture that's for, for crops than for, for meat. So that's like, you know, and, and like that's the day one. And that reduces hugely the pressure on the, on, the, on the ecosystem. So everyone should do that today. And actually, because of that 5x, we can actually sustain a significantly greater population. By the way, I'm not advocating zero meat, but I think I'll, if from an ecological standpoint, a lot less meat it makes a huge amount of sense. And, and actually, having been a vegetarian for years, it's so easy. I mean, it's just like a no-brainer, morally speaking, to just cut it completely out. But certainly cutting it mostly out from an ecological standpoint is, is what we should do. I mean, like, that sort of thing can change the game. So, like, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I hope because, again, we changed our behavior for COVID. So, you know, it's not that hard. Okay, you didn't go to the office for a year. Now just stop eating meat, <laughs> okay? <laughs> like that and a few other things, and we'll we'll get a long way. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not going to argue with that, and I think there is also in the um, uh, Slido that we're using to collect questions a leading question uh, on uh, the ocean, which is what what are the most positive things we could do to ge regenerate the sea, considering that agricultural agricultural runoff is a lot of what what is uh, sterilizing the ocean. I don't know if you agree with that, but. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm not sure it's the dominant uh, factor. Uh, uh, I actually don't know what the dominant factor is. I think the worst thing is things like trawling and overfishing practices. Mm -hmm. If you see that film, Sea Spiracy, it's a good quick overview of at least some of the problem statement. Um, but, but yeah, for the fishing practices, especially ocean trawling, I think the worst. I think the hope here is, I mean, so I went to the Marshall Islands because I own them, you know, obviously. Um, they're named after me. Um, actually, obviously not, but um, I went there uh, to go scuba diving and, um, and of course, the U.S. basically nuked the shit out of those islands um, for a decade or two. I mean, total life wipeout on a lot of them. It is insane how much life has come back. <laughs> like, it, nature bounces back when she's afforded an opportunity. And so I would just say, like, give her a room to breathe and she'll mostly come back. Of course, if we actually wipe out actual species, they won't, all those species can't come back from the dead. Or well, maybe we can do some genetics craziness, but like generally it would be better if we don't get to that point and we let, let her bounce back. But she does bounce back very fast um, when afforded the opportunity. So that's the exciting thing. Like these mar Marshall Islands, are just the reefs were just fish everywhere, the sharks, the corals were all back. And I saw photos of what it was like just, you know, a few decades earlier after the nukes and it was decimated, you know, so, so it's great. That's kind of hope. Um, there is a I love Larry, La Gary Larson cartoon last year, which I, um, was showed um, it, 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 in, 90, in 2019, all the humans looking at the animals in zoos. And then in 2020, all the humans, all the animals walking in the streets, looking at the humans in their houses, in their cages. Like, I, I mean, we've got to have some sort of <laughs> mental fit like that. <laughs> so like, not, not to put ourselves in cages, of course, but we've got to let nature come back and bounce back. And I think give her some space. I'll try to find the, the cartoon and, and share it. Um, what is it called? I, I, it's Gary Larson. I don't know. I, 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 I think look, I don't know how I um, there, there's just if you have uh, just if you can do it in thirty seconds. Like someone is asking a precision about um, how the sixty percent of life wiped out is counted. If it's like number of species or animals or plants, it mostly biomass. by biomass. Uh, and biomass. I can send you a bit. Um, but but 
um, but, and, and number, number rather than uh, species. Um, here's here's okay. a link to a blog that I wrote on it, which, um, which then links to this series of reports that, that have come out, and there's actually been quite a few good ones since then, but, but anyway, it will give you a sense of, of, you can look up how they did it, and it, it, it differs a little bit, but it's, it's things like, you know, you know, roughly how many bears are there now, roughly how many bears were they 40 years ago, and you'll find it's roughly 80% less, you know, awesome. um, and it's of course a little bit crude, um, it's definitely not species number, 68% less, it's, it's, roughly the number of the of the uh, individuals in that species uh, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'll take just one question uh, on this topic from David Meinheim which I'm going to unmute who is uh, an existential hope fellow uh, David since your question is on top of this slider uh, uh, would you kindly ask it to Will? Sure um, thanks, Will. This, this, was, this was really great and very interesting. Um, I, I was wondering, people have been saying for decades that um, we're really close to ecosystem collapse because like, you can't sustain this. Um, and it turns out that um, ecosystems are super resilient somehow to like really, really huge changes. Why is it that now you think that it's really likely that ecosystems are close to a tipping point when, you know, people have people have reasonably said the same thing for decades and it hasn't happened yet? Well, I think it's a very different level of quantification and understanding of it. So there was a lot of sort of airy fairy stuff early on, which is like, well, probably if we knock out this species then this species would go and do it. And it, yeah, there was some resilience there. But what's now m much more clear from my understanding, and I'm not an expert in this, but like it's thing, I, I, but I've read a few papers that really hint at this, for example, one on, um, that was looking at forest fragmentation. And if you, just, if you just randomly take out trees from a forest, say if you have some simplistic model and you randomly take out trees, um, and then if you look at fragmentation, like are different clumps of trees connected, as a function of time, it's like duh, 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 it's, they're all connected and then they, there's a knee in the curve and they suddenly all get not connected. Now, of course, that's not exactly how deforestation happens, but actually a lot of it does happen kind of like that. 40% happens in the form of degradation, which is kind of individual tree level, although they tend to do these, you know, little roads and then they collect individual trees nearby and what have you. But if you take that simplistic assumption, it's when you get to that knee in the curve. And now we know we're getting close to that in a number of places. So I think that that's, that's where uh, we are understanding these systems much more. Again, maybe life will just hop through all of this, but it's damn worrying that we're getting to that sort of fragmentation state. Um, so I, 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 I and, and then there's also just like, you know, key species and things like that. Again, we might get away with it a few times, but as you accelerate species loss, and we've now got a quarter of known species in some sort of extinction risk, threshold, right? 25% of species, about a million of the no, of the sort of categorized 4 million uh, species. Um, that's not good because, you know, <laughs> like you don't want to play <laughs> with that too much. You know, maybe you just wipe out a few more species and then it really does, they, you really do hit a critical. Look, I just don't think it's all right. And, and so, the, you know, the counter argument to any such claim is it, it doesn't really matter if we, we have a I mean, it does matter, but like it matters less whether or not it's a, we have 10 percent, you know, certainty, uncertainty around that that estimate of it's in 10 years or in five years or whatever, when the collapse is going to happen. Then it's not our right to be doing it either fucking way. <laughs> so it's not a it's not a it's not a question up for discussion of whether we should do something about it. It's not our right to commit ecocide on the planet, and that's what we're doing. We need to stop. Great conclusion and also, I mean, on this uh, discussion point, and uh, there are many uh, interesting discussions going on in the chat that is very active around uh, agricultural practices, vegetarianism versus uh, not. Uh, it's, it's really cool. Um, thank you everyone for being so engaged as usual. So the, the other thing I think we should talk about, <laughs> given that, uh, you know, this is also you, your, your main job, let's say, uh, is uh, Planet Labs. And uh, I think what's really interesting about um, 
the the company is um, it has a rare uh, and super strong uh, ethical stance um, and like follows like an ethical chart. So uh, what is, yeah, like how does Planet Lab um, use space to help life on Earth? And I'm interested in talking about uh, things like uh, creating globally accessible digital commons, uh, promoting transparency, uh, empowering local communities and uh, if you felt like touching on on those um, I think uh, it would be very interesting for everyone here to hear it yeah sure um, absolutely um, yeah so so uh, what we do at planet for those that don't know is we have a lot of satellites doing earth imaging um, so we have 200 satellites uh, 180 of which basically image the whole land mass of the earth once per day um, and nearby coastal waters um, and some seas, like um, the Mediterranean, South China Sea, the Caribbean. And um, uh, that's a three meter resolution um, for right now we're upgrading to eight spectral bands, so sort of halfway between those things, but eight spectral bands, so eight colors uh, that, that you can use for various things, like near infrared band helps you to tell biomass, basically, because chlorophyll sticks out like a sore thumb in this particular spectral band, uh, and other things like that. Um, and um, um, then we have a fleet of 21 satellites that do higher resolution, so 50 centimeter um, uh, pixels, but tasked to specific locations. So they're not doing a scan um, each day, um, they're doing a task to particular locations. And then we do analytics and uh, sort of uh, um, basically um, a lot of processing of that data and including analytics on top of that, things like um, uh, detecting roads and buildings and ships and planes uh, using machine learning. So that's a quick overview of what Plant does. Now, why do we do that? Uh, we do that to, to help a variety of users across uh, the commercial, humanitarian, research, government, uh, and you know, use cases. Um, and, um, but mainly it's sort of helping us to understand wide scale areas of the earth, like 25% uh, of the land area of the earth is forest, so we're really helping uh, track and stop deforestation. 25% is agriculture, so we're really trying to help um, uh, farmers improve their crop yields, uh, introduce sustainable um, agricultural practices, things like that. Uh, ma marine areas, large coastal zones, etc. So it's sort of wide area um, sort of coverage that the main applications are for. Um, we more or less um, sent up the fleet to help us to take care of our favorite spaceship, the Earth, really, you know? I mean, we're hurtling around the sun, seven billion um, astronauts, and, and of course, lots of, uh, of other species as well. Um, and we're sort of effectively stewards of this spacecraft. And, and uh, when you have a spacecraft, and when you design a human spacecraft, you, of course, always design the sensor systems to understand any changes. Like if you're in your spacecraft and the oxygen's going up too much or too little or CO2 or if the temperature's rising too fast or whatever, you want to quickly change that. Um, you want to change your angle with respect to the sun to cool down or you want to um, grab the CO2 out of the atmosphere if it's been, and of course these often end up being little experiments where you speed up the process because you're in a much more confined location. So space has always dealt with these closed loop systems or close to closed loop systems and so um, I think is an inspiration for how we deal with the planet and the critical thing for those spacecraft to do that is of course sensors that figure out whether you are I mean you can't do shit about the co2 rising if you don't even know it's risen till the point and then you suffocate right you obviously need to know it early if your spacecraft is in a spin um, you need a timing of that spin, you need to measure that spin faster than the spin time scale. Otherwise, you know, if, you, if it's spinning once a second and you're measuring once a minute, you don't know what to do. You don't have the data. So you need time, you need data, and you need it timely enough for the change, of, uh, 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 the, 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 the time scale of change of those spacecraft. So if I now zoom back out to planet, um, the, the Earth, I mean, um, what we're trying to do with our satellites is have a sensor system around the satellite, around the Earth that takes data on sufficiently fast time scale to do things inside the human decision-making loop to make smarter decisions like a human in a spacecraft would do with the sensor systems that they have available to them. So we're, you know, we're, 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 we're instrumenting the planet with enough data to help us take care of it. Of course, imagery 
is not a one-stop shop so solution to all the instruments that one requires to take care of the earth. There's lots of other things. In agriculture, you need soil pH and um, soil moisture in addition to um, you know, biomass and things like that that we can see. But, um, but a base map of the earth and how it's changing every day turns out to be a pretty good starting point and base layer for assessing a lot of these things. So our, our goal in life is to try and, uh, with that instrumented planner, help en enable people across all these organizations to make smarter decisions, whether it's more efficient use of resources. I mean, just in agriculture, one of the, our mainstays is just selling our imagery to agricultural farms, and they can improve crop yields by 20 to 40 percent and reduce fertilizers by similar sorts of amounts. Well, that's huge, right? I mean, 25 percent of the land mass of the earth is agriculture. If we can improve it all by 20 or 40 percent efficiency and reduce fertilizer by 20 or 40 percent, that's a big deal for the planet in one go, right? So that's the kind of thing, even if it's just an efficiency thing, it's helpful because it's um, it's deconflicting this constraint between uh, the carrying capacity of the Earth and the number of humans. So that's, you know, that's the overall objective of planets, to get that data to help uh, people make those smarter decisions on day-to-day -day resource allocation. Does that make any Very sense? Cool. Yeah, totally. Uh, thank you. And um, do you have any uh, example of how that has worked that like you, for you, you know, it was like this, you know, yeah, we really did it like feeling uh, you really um, moved a piece, you know, and, and give you uh, again, like sort of hope <laughs> to really achieve a lot in the future. Yeah, many things. I mean, look, um, uh, one example um, is that on our for our coral reefs, um, um, Bangladesh didn't even know where their corals were. When they saw that we had mapped their corals, they actually established a marine protection area around those coral systems. Like that's like extremely practical, you know. <laughs> it's now they know, and they send a coast guard vessel occasionally to this place to start uh, fishing and stuff. They didn't know they were there. <laughs> well, that was a problem, but also our monitoring can help them determine when there's those fishing vessels or when there's ocean bleaching. And there's, some, uh, there's not much one can do about the ocean bleaching, but there's, but there's some things one can do. Um, anyway, so yeah, that's an example. There's zillions. And a, a wonderful one. Um... I, and beyond that, I think uh, while we are on the topic of planet, uh, again, something that's super interesting is the way planet thinks about uh, tech ethics. Uh, and I think you, I mean, I know that you think a lot about this question. Uh, so I would love to hear you tell us a bit about precisely how you think about uh, developing tech responsibly, you know, like how do we make uh, humans like responsible stewards and safe stewards of the incredible uh, technological powers we harness and perhaps by you know comparing it with uh, planet labs example um, you know how you think about uh, like concretely how you think about this question for planet yeah well um glad you bring it up i mean i, I think uh, um I am both a techno optimist because I see the ways in which technology can help, and a techno realist in the sense of um, I, of knowing some of the downsides. And I, I think it's super important that technology uh, entrepreneurs and uh, take responsibility uh, for their technology. And it's everyone's responsibility. It's the governments that regulate. It's the individuals that use the technology, and it's the technologists that build it. Um, but um, the technologists play a particularly important role um, uh, because often the regulation is not keeping up with the new technology and it's already having big societal impacts before the Senate or Congress or whatever re relevant regulation body in the EU or et cetera has even understood it, let alone regulated it. And so it's had its wicked way. Of so, I, I, mean, look, I, I mean, I think the most important thing is uh, the most important thing by far is to vote with your feet um, on doing things that uh, are building technologies that are um, good for the world. And everyone says, well, of course, every technology can be used for good and bad. And that's like, you know, like 
like the first line introduction to tech ethics, and that's true. Every technology can be used for good and bad. I can take this cup and I can smack it over someone's head, and it's true that that technology. But you know, generally, this cup is really useful, and it, it I, you know, the more value uh, comes from drinking from it. Which is to say that technology is bent um, towards good and bad. Um, nuclear technology, I would much prefer the whole thing gone, even though there's medical benefits. There's, um, there's lots of, uh, of, of medical benefits. The cost of the existential risk to humans of, of having nuclear weapons far outweighs, in my opinion, those medical benefits. And I would rather, if I could, wish it all away. I would wish it all away. And I think, and of course, we can't do that. It's here. But I'm, uh, so I'm not trying to be naive. But where you decide to put your en energy as entrepreneurs in the world results in what happens. And let's vote with our feet and pick the technologies that are more bent towards good and bad than bad. I think you know anything to do with you know tracking uh, cell phone data or looking at facial recognition is dodgy territory because it really invi invades privacy. Um, and I think there's a lot of stuff um, which is is very good on the whole. And so, firstly, it's picking that. Secondly, then, e even any good technology, and I think of Earth Earth imaging largely as doing good. Um, of course, always has some bad use cases. And so think them through. First job is to think them through and try to do what you can to avoid them, right? Um, and how we do that at Planet is we, we, we always think through the technology, uh, the ethical implications of every new technology development. And we have an ethics committee that reviews our new products and our new relationships with, with potential vendors, looks at what they're going to do with it, looks at their intent, their past record, and in occasional cases, denies us to, to, to partner with those entities. We're very selective about that. There is a worry, of, as people say, of playing God. But I think the playing God is way too held up as like, oh, put up my hands, I can't do anything. I'm just gonna put my technology out there and technology is neutral and it can be used for good or bad bullshit. It's bent towards good or bad and how you do things, um, how you deploy that technology has a big impact. So. So let's let's try and steer it. And I think having ethics committees is something. Yeah, we we've done that. I, I hope other tech companies will. I think it's a good way of doing things. Is that going to be perfect? No. Are we going to make mistakes? Yes. Uh, but it's sure as hell going to reduce the amount of them. I would imagine, and hopefully stop us from doing anything really uh, harmful. Um, and um, and or react quickly in the case where we do. And look, I mean, it's, 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 you know. Um, for example, personal privacy is affected by satellite data. It's not, we can't actually see a person. So you, it's not like drones where you can see a person and identify their features and figure out who it is. We can't do that. But we can track vehicles at some level, right? And so if you, are, if you have other data that identifies a person with a vehicle, maybe you can track the person. And so there's personal privacy things. How do we get around that, right? Um, or countries might use it to target civilians, especially our higher resolution data. Um, so how do we avoid those entities that might use that data in that way to stop, stop them from doing so. So it's our job to try and um, uh, to manage that as best we can, even though the vast majority of the uses is, is uh, scanning the planet for ecosystem loss and things like that. that we, I think uh, the, 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 the good side of it uh, stands to reason. Uh, that's awesome, and you're receiving uh, encouragement in the chat. Lauren is saying, uh, uh, well done with the ethics culture, Will, and uh, I'm, I'm quite uh, glad you made that point also about uh, technology being neutral. Uh, I, I, I could not agree more uh, with it. Um, there's also someone who is asking if you're planning to expand planets to the African continent and want to collaborate <laughs> and join your team. So <laughs> oh, maybe I that should maybe want to create that. And extension necessary. We already image all of Africa every day. So we're already there, of course, the satellites by very, very nature um, scan the whole planet. Um, uh, we can't avoid Africa. We can't steer around it or something. We can't come to Africa and turn left. Uh, so we're taking pictures of Africa. Um, we don't have enough partnerships there, and uh, we would love to establish more. Um, I think it, in, in some senses that we have had some de developing collaborations with developing countries where they've used our data in ways that are much more inspired than uh, the developed countries because uh, it's a bit like the cell phone, you know, jumping, skipping a, a generation of uh, technology. 
you, it can be done here a lot, managing illegal mining, helping improve agriculture yields, stopping deforestation, all in one uh, foul swoop where, where, um, where you don't have the resources. I mean, a lot of these developing countries don't have enough resources to protect their parks um, or, you know, like that one in Bangladesh. So just having the technology to know where to put their resources, their one Coast Guard vessel or whatever, you know, to tell them, well, here's the problem, is, is already a big advance because they can't monitor all the borders, right? Um, so it's technology that helps their smaller resources to take care of their biodiverse regions. I mean, and, and of course, uh, we have to be really um, um, good partners here because the vast majority of biodiversity is in developing countries. And in fact, 40% of it is on the lands of indigenous people on the, in terms of biodiversity on the land. And so we have to work with developing countries and we have to work with uh, indigenous peoples in those developing countries to help take care of those key critical, um, key biodiverse areas. Um, okay, and uh, I would, since we are like 10 minutes uh, before the, the end of our call, I really want to touch on our last point, which is uh, global cooperation. Um, at Foresight, we talk a lot about cooperation. We, in fact, have a whole uh, expert group called Intelligent Voluntary Cooperation dedicated to exploring how we can leverage artificial intelligence uh, and uh, crypto um, cryptography to to foster um, uh, collective intelligence and cooperation to to uh, yeah or govern I mean do self-government um, mm -hmm. so um, I would really love to hear your thought on um, I know you think a lot about geopolitics um, you talk a lot about geopolitics with people who are involved into geopolitics um, what uh, you recently actually co-published an article about the need for cooperation between the US and China in space um, that you co-authored with Chris Hadfield, by the way, um, uh, to recall. And uh, yeah, so maybe starting with this and taking also your uh, broad view picture um, what are your thoughts on the current state of human cooperation and its ability to meet our meta challenges? Yeah. Well, gosh, obviously there's, a, there's so much to say on that, and I'm not the world's expert on that stuff. Uh, but uh, from our little vantage point in space, um, we do see a few things that, that give a unique perspective. One is just that we, we see a little bit what the astronauts see, which is that really the borders are these fiction <laughs> that we've made up um, uh, you, almost in al almost all countries you can't see borders between one country and another and this is, this is what leads to this so-called overview effect when people go up there they're just like oh wow <laughs> that's all just uh, you know a human made up uh, we're one planet and then we have this fragile little atmosphere protecting us from the, the vacuum and 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 radiations and other things in space that uh, you know it's just an incredible um, planet and people are in awe by that and then they put down a little bit their terrestrial differences um, and in that way uh, space has been a place of cooperation um, even during the height of the Cold War uh, the uh, US and Russia did a project called Apollo Soyuz where they mated an Apollo uh, vehicle with a Soyuz capsule in orbit and they handshaked famously um, showed each other around their spacecraft, and it was really cool. And then that led to Russian-U.S. collaboration further in the International Space Station, which they built together. Um, and in fact, the Russians built the first module. And they kept on doing that all through hot and cold times of their relationship. Um, the U.S. Uh, actually, for a long period, over a decade, didn't have any system to get humans into space and only got the humans to space via um, the Russian Soyuz vehicle. The U.S., when the Soyuz was done, it helped ship some Russian cargo to the ISS. You know, they, they, they've done that through thick and thin. Amazingly, when, when Putin and Trump or whatever are arguing about whatever, um, and I, I think space has this, um, it's a little bit above our terrestrial concerns. And, and, and that way, I think it can be a beacon of hope for everyone 
um, to suggest that we collaborate. Um, and, and so when countries do this, and the point of that article, I'll just show it now actually, um, was to say, um, oops, um, this is high time for the US and China to do this because they seem to be on this diversion course. People are talking about the splinter net. People are talking about um, you know, AI cooperation. People are talking about trade restrictions. People are talking about all these things. Um, I think, obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's incalculably stupid if the US and China end up going to war um, in the modern age, that we want to keep this cold, uh, not a hot <laughs> situation, and we want to collaborate with them ultimately. What better place to start than space um, um, as a symbol of cooperation, just like the US and Russia did during the height of the Cold War. And so uh, this article is just making that point. Hopefully the Biden administration is a little bit more receptive to that because it's really been the US that has been sort of blocking that for a long time. The Chinese actually asked to be part of the International Space Station, the US, uh, and all the other partners, Japan, ESA, uh, Canada were okay with it, but the US blocked it. And, and that unfortunately led to this situation where now they're just building their own stuff. But perhaps uh, we can revisit that, and potentially with lunar exploration, which both the Chinese and the U.S. are embarking on, there could be some joint missions, and that would symbolize to the rest of the planet uh, that there's some place where the countries cooperate and is a bit above our terrestrial concerns and can be a symbol of cooperation for all the people in those countries. And I think it's, it's a worthwhile endeavor, so uh, we wrote that piece. Uh, and had Colonel, Colonel Chris Hadfield, who's a friend, uh, also flew up on the Soyuz and the shuttle, so he knew both systems. He commanded the International Space Station, which is both and sort of from a, uh, and he's a Canadian astronaut, uh, but I think it, um, he was a, almost a symbol of that cooperation in the US-Russia uh, case, or even though he was a Canadian astronaut. Um, yeah, yeah, wonderful. And actually makes me think about a sort of follow-up question based on one of the questions that is, um, in, in the in the slido which is about how we should think about um, our um, expansion into space and how to allocate resources and that's also something you've been working on and perhaps uh, quickly you could share like some vision here about you know how we should even think about this like should we think about it in terms of okay who like first come first served or you know <laughs> maybe this is a little bit of a leading question but uh, what, yeah. what, like how, how do you think about it <laughs> a bit leading but fine um hey look look um <laughs> The interesting thing, I mean, basic education first, like there's not much space law. <laughs> Roughly, you can do anything. You can't put nukes up because the, the U.S. did that, exploding nuke. All the uh, satellites died, and then the U.S. and Russia were like, well, you shouldn't do that again. And uh, then they, they banned that. But but pretty much everything else, is, there's this founding document called the Outer Space Treaty, which is just a beautiful piece of work, by the way, inspired in the, in, the, in the height of the Cold War again, mainly by the U.S. and Russia not wanting each other to... Thing. And it says things like um, uh, that, we, uh, that our our job is to is to is to do things peacefully, not to put military installations on other celestial bodies, uh, to help one another, and and it should be a peaceful domain for human cooperation, basically. And so there's some wonderful founding principles. But when it comes to lots of practical things, um, like who owns bits of the moon. There's no answer. In fact, it says that you can't, it kind of is a clear answer to that. You can't claim ownership to bits of the moon or other bodies. But the details just haven't been worked out. There's literally this much law of, the, of space. If you look at the law of the land or law of the sea, it's you know, like a pile you know, the size of a room or something. And there's basically no law on space. And so, yeah, we could have a Wild West sort of situation per the same sort of attitude to technology. I think we should be a little bit more thoughtful than that. We should think ahead and think about the known problems. Um, when I was at NASA, I was part of a mission that we sent to the moon that was looking for water on the moon, and we found water on the poles. So there had been 72 prior missions to the moon, and no one had found water, and it's because it was in a kind of unusual location in the, in the poles, which doesn't sound so surprising, right, but in permanently shadowed craters. And uh, by definition, they get no sunlight, so the orbiting instruments hadn't seen it because they rely on reflected light. And no one had been landed anything on the poles because it's slightly harder to get there. Okay, so no one had found the water. And we found lots of water on the um, south pole of the moon where we impacted and extrapolating that to the other, uh, the rest of the dark shadowed craters. There's quite a bit of water on the moon, but it's only in very small areas. <laughs> 
so even though the moon is the area of Africa, it's like all the resources in greater Nairobi and greater Johannesburg or something, right? And so, of course, everyone's going to go there. The peaks of eternal light, the access to all of the high, high, um, 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 all the volatiles, including yeah, water, CO2, like hydrocarbons, nitrates. It's all concentrated in these two tiny areas. And of course, everyone's going to go there. And there's private actors going there and governments going there, uh, like China, the US. And I think we need to think through, yeah, resource rights uh, there. Um, I think some use of it, but it should also be somewhat equitable. Uh, obviously, the biggest thing to avoid is monopolies. But also, I think it's not just important to think about it carefully ahead of those problems, but also to, because it's precedent setting for how we then do it for the next planet and the next planet and the next planet. So it actually is really like if we get this right, we get it really right for a lot of the future. And if we get it wrong, it's really wrong. So another bit of a fork in the road. Uh, we started a little foundation, a few of us uh, called the Open Lunar Foundation. It was just thinking about that, those things. Um, I think it's just openlunar.org. I'll just show that. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's right. Um, uh, and uh, you should have uh, Jesse Cohen, Sharp, Shingler do a talk on this stuff um, at some point um, because she knows all about that. Um, but um, but I think it's a really great uh, initiative because we need to, some actors thinking about this and they're a non-profit trying to get ahead of a commercial grab or a national grab of these resources that's obviously impending um, if we don't do something about it. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. And um, we actually had Jesse uh, for a salon, oh, not virtual, but at the time where we were still doing uh, salons in person, which was a awesome one. I really recommend everyone, uh, I mean, if you're interested in this topic, check the link that Tony shared right now in the chat. Um, for our YouTube viewers, uh, I will link to all the links that were shared, but uh, it's a fantastic uh, TED talk on uh, what you know, building civilization on the moon means for life on Earth, and and how we can do that um, ethically or like a useful framework to think about it. Um, and Jessica will actually join the session uh, we have um, uh, a session we have soon in one or two sessions about uh, you know the lessons uh, for. Uh, you know, thinking about civilization in space and the lessons uh, for Earth. So that's uh, in the plan, of course. Um, it's one. Uh, would you have time for maybe one or two more questions? There's a, a question that was voted that got uh, quite a bit yeah. of success about. Yeah. Um, Creon, maybe you want to, um, you can ask your question directly. I'm, I'm unmuting you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I have a couple, but I mean, um, Just what? It, 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 yeah, sure. So the one that's got the top votes right now is where and or how could planets data make the most positive impact on the biosphere, but where it currently is not, what stands in the way? Mm. Um, I think it's biodiverse regions um, especially coastal wetlands like mangroves and seagrass and and other marsh lands and things like that. We don't really do anything there, and we could help protect those. Um, uh, mangroves have four times the carbon content per unit area as as the richest rainforest, so it's critical for carbon as well as uh, biodiversity. Um, and what's as well as keeping money? as well as well as keeping the oceans and the wetlands clean. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so and what's standing in the way is money, meaning, um, you know, we can't just give away our data for free. We spent a lot of money uh, putting up these satellites and building them and launching them. And um, so we need to find a partner like Norway on deforestation or um, Paul Allen on the corals um, before we passed away um, to help us to, to fund those initiatives. But we have the data, but, you know, we have to build the systems on top of that and and um but but i think that would be a great one cool thanks creon uh, for the question um i guess to finish this session i like to ask what's your call to action you know like now you have 
uh, this wonderful, really cool, uh, uh, super engaged people. I mean, uh, you know, if, when you see the chat and the questions, like everyone is really um, thinking hard and and thinking deeply about these topics. Um, what what do you want to tell uh, the 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 attendees and your co conspirator for good who are on this call? Well, I, I don't know, actually. I, I think that uh, it's a really hard question, and I'm not the world's expert to tell people what to do, you know? Like, um, we obviously, um, and there's smarter people than I on this call to answer that question. I don't know. Um, but I, I think there are simple things we can do. Um, I, 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 I think we are overall boxed in a little bit with the carrying capacity of the Earth um, and, and um, the number of people. Uh, it's just, um, and while we are, obviously, I'm not suggesting a genocide, I think that's a bad way out. Um, but I think while we have this cash flow challenge, um, I think we, we have, we're a little bit boxed in. We have to be a little bit careful about our, uh, our constraints um, uh, to, to not have a big impact on the environment. I think there's actually a beautiful way to live. It just involves a slightly more simple way, right? Less flying, less eating meat and, and these sorts of things. And, um, uh, but I th actually think we can get more connected to nature that way. You know, I loved and relished the fact that during the COVID, I spent much more time in nature. And uh, um, that doesn't cost anything, and it inspires you about protecting nature. So, great, let's go do that, rather than traveling to the other side of the planet to lay on a beach in Bali, which sounds great, but, like, you know, that's, that's costly. Or having lots of steaks, you know, like, have that beautiful vegetarian meal, you know, like, it's, it, they, they can be delicious, you know, um, and that sort of thing, and volunteer at a local park, and, and, and try and help them protect it from local, um, you know, challenges and in, in, in human incursion, like, those, you know, it's, it's simple things like that is on the ground that I would urge people to do, and then I would just also say, please help me to spread the word that it's a biodiversity uh, emergency and ecocide, not a climate emergency. <laughs> We've just got this ass backwards. Um, it's, uh, the, the climate will hurt biodiversity, but the climate is not the point in of itself, and and climate is not the driving factor. So help spread that meme a little bit because I think when people focus more on biodiversity, the lovely animals and plants that we have around us, uh, it's, it's more interesting, it's more compelling as a focus, and it's more direct to the point. And when you get direct to the point, it's stopping things like deforestation. Um, so let's go help that uh, immediately and direct uh, challenge that's happening to that biodiversity. Well, thank you, Will, for joining us. Uh, we touched on a lot of points. It was like quite, quite a uh, uh, high energy session. So thank you so much. Um, yeah. And um, you know, thank you for sharing this such an point uh, with Earth Day, and um, yeah, I hope everyone has a, a, a great Earth Day and, and uh, carries the ecosystem in their heart and, and mind. Um, yeah. Yeah. And thank you infinitely, Will. Uh, and oh, no. yeah, good luck with everything. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Happy Earth Day. Really enjoyed having this chat. Bye, everyone. See you next session.